Hello once again, uh, welcome to another edition of our Azure webinars. My name is Hearn Sermida, I'm the Azure Business Lead for Microsoft Philippines. And today's topic is about business continuity and disaster recovery using Azure. Now BCDR or business continuity disaster recovery are one of those um, one of those capabilities within Azure that is used by a lot of people. So the, usually the first step that people uh, the first thing that people use Azure for is to ensure that whatever applications, data, and infrastructure they have in their current data center is replicated on Azure because uh, of the reasons that you will find out later on, the cloud becomes a viable source of, or viable destination for um, uh, this business continuity and disaster recovery for on-premises applications, infrastructures, databases, and what have you. Um, if you are listening to this webinar, um, I apologize in advance if you are listening, um, if you are, um, if you're picking up some background noise like people talking, dogs barking, birds chirping. Um, this webinar, uh, this webinar is actually being conducted out of my own home. Like many of you, I'm sure you're listening to this webinar from your own homes as well, or from a remote location, not from your office location, because at this very moment we are still in enhanced community quarantine. Uh, I'll try my best to be as as as, uh, as clear as far as delivering this webinar is concerned. And if you have any questions, there is an opportunity for you to ask questions if you enter it into the Q&A window in the box. Um, in the in your webinar interface. This entire webinar is also recorded uh, so from beginning to end. So if you miss any parts of this webinar, if you have uh, if you you're late, that's no problem. You will actually receive an email with a recording of the with the link to the recording of this webinar after about 24 or 48 hours at the end of this webinar. So you can listen to this entire webinar on demand uh, on any time, any place using a browser on a device with an internet connection. So if you have any more questions and if I have, uh, if I've not answered any of your questions during the conduct of this webinar, you can definitely send me an email at hermida at microsoft.com. All right, so let's start the webinar right now. Now, why do bad things happen? <laughs> so obviously the reason why we are thinking about business, business continuity and disaster recovery in terms of our IT systems is because bad things always happen. And because there are so many things that are actually happening in the world right now, um, and there are many sources of uh, problems, it can be something, it, it's not just an IT issue, it can be anywhere between an issue with the, or inst with the institution or organization that you are working on. Um, there are procedures that are incomplete. There may be problems with the team, like in your team, you have inadequate training so much so that some systems fail to become resilient and, um, and go down quite rapidly. Um, individ it all boils down sometimes to the individual itself, um, and also sometimes it all boils down to the <clears throat> to the build up of the application. The build up of the application itself is it um, is there are there code problems and so on. But as far as IT disasters are concerned, if you do a quick survey of all of the possible causes of an IT disaster, it can be whittled down to three different categories. It can be an operational failure, such as, for example, a power failure, IT hardware failure, network failure, or software failure. A majority is also caused uh, by natural disasters, like your, disa like your data center is hit by a hurricane or a typhoon or a flood or a fire or earthquake. It can also be caused by human cost events. And a vast majority of human cost events is because of uh, a standard human error. Somebody clicked, uh, clicked something that, it, that that person is, isn't supposed to click. Somebody basically made a mistake. And um, of course, uh, uh, on sec in second place is malicious uh, access by an insider or even an outsider. Now think about the impact of an outage in your business. So, so there, this is the reason why most of you are in this webinar because you you already know that something something is going to something bad is going to happen to your business. So we want to plan accordingly. So the impact of the outage is on the outage itself. It will cause the problems as far as reputation of your brand, and it can also be but that honestly be it can also be detrimental to your own uh, IT career. Now, how do we measure the impact of an outage? So think about your most important system right now. Say, for example, your ERP system, which is the lifeblood of your entire organization. Say, for example, it, gets, it becomes unavailable to users for, say, for example, four hours. Now, during those four hours, how much does it cost the company in terms of revenue, lost revenue, 
Uh, so that's the total cost of unplanned application downtime. Think about the per minute cost of that downtime. So apart from the amount of revenue that you're losing in that four hours, you simply divide that by the amount of um, revenue that probably is going to lost or opportunity cost due every minute. And then how long does also does it take for you to recover from these outages in minutes? So those are the three most important probably the most important parameters in terms of sizing. Uh, if you were going to set priorities on which applications you want to plan BCDR for, these are probably the three most important parameters. Now, of course, in any IT projects, there's always going to be challenges in terms of implementing business continuity. And the top three challenges has always been around cost. Like, of course, you're going to spend money around expanding the capabilities of your data center, resources, hardware, and software. The second, uh, the second um, challenge is complexity because we have we are now living you are now living in an environment where you have probably multiple data centers multiple storage mediums multiple so multiple uh, operating systems a very heterogeneous environments of different types of applications of different ages and the third is uh, compliance so there is a need for you to retain your data. There is a need for you to provide a service to store and archive this data in case the need arises. And it is also becoming challenging to comply with the many types of compliance standards that you need to comply with. How we can help is, of course, we can reduce the cost, we can reduce the complexity, and we can increase your compliance when you perform BCDR. And let's discuss how we exactly do that. Because you are using Azure, which is a public cloud service, you don't actually need to purchase any additional hardware. A lot of the BCDR capabilities that are inherent in Azure does not include any additional hardware that you need to extend in your data center. Sometimes you can actually do, reuse your existing hardware that it is inside your data center. There are also no secondary site resource cores, meaning you don't have to build a second data center because you have 58 regions all over the world to choose from. 58 being the 58 different Azure regions um, that's available all over the world. So pick and choose which one you want to use. And you also pay for what you use. You don't have you don't have any capital outlays to buy additional hardware, servers, software, and storage mediums. The way we reduce complexity is that all of these services, we'd like to think that you can be onboarded fast with these different cloud services. Uh, you can do simpler execution for testing and failover because in any good BCDR disaster recovery and resiliency plan, you'd have to be able to test your capability to recover from a simulated disaster uh, so that you can practice and also be able to recover according to the commitments that you have to the business during an actual disaster. You also want to integrate business continuity as a service. The third is how do we increase compliance? You can take advantage of Azure's industry leading certification portfolio. The current number of data centers all over the world is about 58 data center regions and all of them comply with the world's uh, close to about 200 security uh, certifications uh, from all the way from ISO to country level requirements in terms of security certifications. You can also increase your applications, your to coverage of your applications to meet your compliance requirements. So you have a choice if you want, for example, if you're working, if you're an organization that works for an, for an industry that has uh, compliance requirements in terms of uh, data residency or, 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 or proximity of the, of the disaster recovery site, uh, together with uh, versus your primary site, then you have uh, you have multiple choices as far as Azure is concerned. Now there are two things that we need to define properly before we go on. First is what we mean by reliability and what we mean by resilience. Reliability is essentially the what. This is the goal of your production system. This is what we commit to our customers. We want to be able to tell our customers and our users that yes, this application that you're currently using will be available 99.99% of the time. And that translates to certain number of minutes or hours within a year of downtime. You can set the timeline of your reliability by year, by month, by day, what have you. But the point here is that this is essentially a promise to your customers or to your users that the application will be available at a certain amount of time. Resiliency, on the other hand, think about that as the how. This is the way in which production systems can reach achieve reliability. So resilience is also 
putting in the notion in your head that it is not to avoid any or all failures. In fact, you are actually expecting that there will be a failure. And we've already established that in the beginning of this webinar that there are many, many causes of possible IT systems failure. So it is essentially telling your users that if in case in that very rare occurrence that the application is not available, how fast are you going to be able to recover this application so that your users can go back to normal? So think of reliability as, hey, Mr. or Miss user, this application will be available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, except for probably two to three hours per month wherein there is planned or unplanned maintenance. Now, during the time when there is unplanned maintenance, we, we guarantee that this application will become available in two hours time. That is called resilience. Now, building reliable systems is a shared responsibility between yourselves as the IT administrator, as the IT planner within your organization, and also of the service provider. So your application, that's your app or your workload architecture, is built on the resiliency features of Azure. So this includes high availability, disaster recovery, and backup capabilities within Azure, which, which we're going to use most of the time in this webinar to discuss more about, and also taking advantages or leveraging the core Azure capabilities that are built into the platform. How there are built-in capabilities in Azure to ensure that you can recover quickly in the in the in the in the event of a failure. Now look at the chart in front of you. Resiliency, like I said, is a joint effort between customers and service provider. It depends on how you deploy your application. If you're using, uh, if you're using uh, Azure as infrastructure as a service, if you will, IaaS, um, we provide, Microsoft provides uh, redundancy and re resiliency as far as the power and the facility is concerned. Networking, uh, is partially a responsibility of yourself and us because we, will, if for example Microsoft gives reliability on uh, the the networking capabilities, but you also have to make sure that you configure your network properly. So as far as IS is concerned, if you see the diagram, the 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 everything from the database to the application, the operating system, the storage, that's your responsibility. This responsibility becomes split if you use Azure for the platform as a service. So in this case, you bring your data and you bring your you bring your data and you bring your uh, your your code to be run on the key, on, on on platforms within Azure. So so you can see that the virtual machine or operating systems and the workload in the application, or sorry, the VM or the operating system all the way down to the power and the facility, the data centers is the service provider's responsibility, whereas the data in the application is yours. When you shift over to software as a service, for example, if you're using uh, Dynamics 365 or Office 365, the data and the application is parse, the data is yours and the application and or the keep or the responsibility of maintaining the application uh, remains yours because um, for example in the case of office 365 although we provide the code and the capabilities for office 365 you would have to be doing the administration of the application itself in terms of permissions and users now what are the different uh, resiliency capabilities in azure as a platform uh, that we have available across the different layers. So you can see it here in the diagram. It can range between Azure Backup, uh, the built-in capabilities between Azure SQL and MySQL database for databases. Uh, we have services such as Azure Site Recovery, uh, the ability for you to create availability sets using vir on virtual machines, uh, using local zone or geo-redundant storage or managed disks, and different uh, capabilities to use uh, regional pairs or availability zones. I'm going through this quite quickly because I'm actually going to discuss more of them uh, as we go along in this webinar. Now the other things that the other terms that you that you that we need to get agreement on is the differences between an SLA and SLO and an SLA and SLI. SLA or service level agreement is essentially an external facing agreement. This is an agreement between Microsoft and you that uh, that, it, that we have on paper, it's essentially an agreement between you and you and Microsoft that says that the services that you're using will be available at 99.9% or 99.99% for these different capabilities. So 
it is also an agreement between you and your users. It's a guarantee to your users that the application will be available in 99.99%. .99%. Of course, it's common sense that you're going to have to base your service levels to your users based on the service level agreement that you have with Microsoft. So for example, if you're using a, a different set of components wherein the lowest SLA of that component is 99.9%, .9%, it just doesn't make sense for you to commit to your customers that the service that you will be providing is 99.99% .99 available because the component you're, you're using on the Azure side will not uh, provide that. It will still remain at 99.9%. .9%. So service level objective, on the other hand, or SLO, is your internal organization or your team goal. So think about it as um, a parameter or a commitment in terms of how uh, responsive the application is going to be. So think about uh, the app is considered successful if, let's say, 99% per, of users are processed within 15 seconds. Okay, so over over uh, over uh, over uh, over a seven year period, or seven day period. So that's what is called the service level objective. So while service levels, while SLA or service level agreement is an agreement between you and your users on uptime or availability, service level objective is uh, is is a little bit more detailed in terms of the performance in the application. Service level indicators is usually a measure that you can use. Um, that can be potentially shared externally. So how the app is currently performing. So SLI, think of it as a dashboard item, if you will. So if a custom, if so, if your users are asking you how successful your application is in terms of uh, in terms of response time, in terms of performance, you can say that it is currently uh, processing or able to service X number of users uh, over the committed number of users that you've set in the beginning. So these are, this is important for you to define. Uh, it is important for you to define, define these for, for your organizations because it ensures the alignment between business and IT stakeholders and it uh, solidifies your commitment to your users uh, in terms of performance of your applications. Now, depending on the availability that you are guaranteeing for your customers, it also largely depends on the, think about the uh, business criticality or the mission criticality of the application that you are uh, committing for. So if you take a look at this diagram, uh, applications that are doing batch processing, data extraction, or transfer low jobs, the availability there may be 99%. Whereas in the other, other end of the spectrum, ATMs and telecommunication system, your SLA there may be 5 nines or 99.99%. .99%. So therefore, it, you can't, it is not practical to say that every IT system or every IT component that you have within your IT infrastructure is going to be 99.99999%. You'd have to set priorities based on how critical each application or component should be. And based on the SLAs, the SLOs, and the SLIs that you have committed to your users, you'd have to choose a business continuity strategy. Now, there's always been a debate on whether are we going to go HA or high availability, disaster recovery, or backup? The answer there is you're going to need all three. Again, if you go back to the previous slide, it depends on the SLAs and, the, and how fast you're going to recover from potential failures or the resiliency requirements of the applications that you have. Some applications will require high, high availability. Some applications will require disaster recovery, while some applications will, uh, will just can live with just using backup. High availability, high availability essentially means that is that when your ap applications have a catastrophic failure, you have a second instance that immediately can take over and therefore your resiliency here is very high and the downtime is practically very low or close to zero. Disaster recovery on the other hand is when your applications have a catastrophic failure, you, there's a there's a replica there's a replica on Azure or any other secondary data center, but it will take time for you to switch over to that replica. So therefore, the resiliency is a little bit lower and the recovery time is higher. Backup, on the other hand, is when your data is corrupted, deleted, or lost, you can simply restore it. So think about um, backup as uh, so. For example, if your database get goes gets wiped out for whatever reason, maybe human or hardware or software failure, you have a backup of your database and you have to recover that backup from your storage medium and restore it to the database. Uh, 
compared to disaster recovery in HA, backup is going to take the most time for you to recover from that failure because you're still recovering data from your backup system. So I'd like to use the I, I, I like to use the uh, the analogy of a cell phone. So for example, if you have a mobile phone, if you have two mobile phones and both of those, let's say you have two iPhones, the two iPhones are constantly replicating each other. All your texts, your, your messages, your applications, your, 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 your photos, your videos are being replicated to the second iPhone by, the, by iCloud. That's how high availability. So in case something happens to your first phone, you can immediately switch to your other phone and you can continue. Disaster recovery, if you think about it, it's like having your second phone uh, getting replicas from your first phone, but your second phone is actually not with you in your person right now, but it's actually at home. So in case your first phone gets stolen, you don't have a phone until you go home to pick up the second phone. Backup, on the other hand, is that you don't have a second phone. Um, you actually have your entire backup of your phone in the cloud so that in case something happens with your phone or it gets stolen or gets broken, you can buy another phone and then restore the data from your cloud to your second phone. So among those, you can now you can see the difference between um, how fast you can recover from failure depending on which one you're going to choose. So think, of, think, think, and remember to think about resiliency as not being a, not avoiding failures, but responding to failures and how fast you can recover from those failures. Now let's take a look at a more IT-driven example. So let's take a look. Let's take a, let's take an example of uh, business continuity in action. So this is very typical. So let's say you have a three-tier web application. You have a virtual machine that runs Linux Apache, which is your web tier. There's two of them. And then you have an app tier that runs your PHP engine. There's two of them. And you have a single MySQL database that also runs on a virtual machine. And all of these are running in your data center in Makati over uh, a virtual machine that is being served by VMware, uh, ESX, which is your hypervisor. So the reason why you have two Linux Apache services is because you're very co conscious that one one of the web uh, one of the web uh, tiers might fail, so you can switch over to the other one. Now, what you can do is that you can actually have the exact replica of your setup on Azure. So let's say you choose Azure Southeast Asia Cent Asia Data Centers, which is based in Singapore. Where you, have, where you are replicating the Linux Apache servers from your VMs on-prem to, 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 to Azure. You're doing the same thing, replicating your, your application VMs that are running PHP engines on-prem to Azure, and you are also using replication to replicate data from MySQL to another MySQL VM on Azure. What happens is when there is a disaster or when, say, for example, your on-premises data center becomes unavailable due to a massive data center failure or simply your network not, doesn't become available, meaning everything is still running, it's just that it's not reachable, your load balancer or your traffic manager can simply switch over traffic to your public Azure, uh, to your replica of your entire setup on the Azure, uh, on, in your Azure region. So your problem is solved. So in this case, it is high availability because you can easily switch over from one system to the other uh, with little to no data loss because uh, data from one from your physical setup is being replicated to your uh, to your Azure setup on a regular basis. So another example here is backup. So let's say you don't want to this not this is not a very critical application or you just this simply don't have the budget to configure. Uh, the exact setup on Azure. So you can actually have use a system, use a service called Azure Backup to backup your entire MySQL database to Azure Backup. And then, for example, if your uh, database fails because, uh, let's say your application fails because of a database failure, you can simply access your Azure Backup and then replicate it over to a newly installed uh, MySQL instance in the same VM or a different VM. Your resiliency here will be much lower because you are restoring from backup and during that time your application becomes unavailable. So another pos another possible uh, another possible configuration of this is that it's similar to the first one where you have a, your setup your setup mirrored from uh, from physical data center to the uh, to to your to to Azure Southeast Asia region but your but you can actually also configure your MySQL to Azure backup so just in case your MySQL database in Azure becomes misconfigured, becomes unavailable, you can restore it easily from backup. 
So another setup is, as you, if you can see the difference here, is that you have you no longer use a physical data center, but you use two different Azure regions. You have the Apache and the PHP web servers and MySQL servers running on uh, the Azure Southeast Asia region, which is in Singapore. And then using uh, replication tools from Azure, you replicate the data center and the SQL database to a similar setup, but in a different region, which is Azure East Asia region. Azure East Asia physically is located in Hong Kong. So the capability of, so you've seen how Azure Backup works. Azure Backup does not just store, does, it, it does a lot of things. It, not, it doesn't just backup databases, but it can also backup files from on-premise. It can also backup um, desktops. In fact, we have a lot of customers because of the fear of uh, ransomware. Even the desktops that runs Windows can be rep can be backed up to, to, to Azure using Azure Backup. You see there the word Azure Site Recovery. This is actually the service that allows you to replicate virtual machines from on-premise to the cloud or virtual machines from one Azure region to another or even virtual machines running on other cloud service providers such as AWS or Google Cloud Platform to Azure. So it enables all the combination of both these two will enable high availability, disaster recovery, and backup. And because they are Azure services, they can be used on demand, it pay as you. Now, like I said, you can use Azure VMs, uh, use, you can use Azure Site Recovery to replicate Azure virtual machines. It can replicate virtual machines that runs on Hyper-V, VMware, or even bare metal. It can also replicate virtual machines that practically run any type of application from Exchange Server to SAP to SharePoint to even uh, custom-based applications. You can do the replication across site-to-site -site VPN or even a dedicated connection such as Express Route from your on-premise to the cloud. It's simple. It uh, leverages your current investments. You don't have to actually add any more hardware in your uh, on-premise data center. Um, and you can ensure that your applications meet your compliance requirements. So this is actually a quick way for you to create disaster recovery plans for your infrastructure on-premise. If you're running VMs, almost always, I guarantee 99% of the time that can be supported by Azure Site Recovery. You just simply subscribe to, Google, to Azure and use ASR to copy your VMs or to copy your VMs or replicate your VMs from on-premise to the cloud. And you can choose between, and like I said, whether you use Azure Site Recovery or Azure Backup, you can choose from anywhere between any of the 58 different Azure regions. If you want to replicate your entire VMs in your entire data center to, let's say, the Western United States, you can cert certainly do that. So the examples that we have seen so far is that uh, a three-tiered web application. This is a very typical uh, three-tiered web-based application that runs on virtual machines. You've got a web tier, you have an available, you have an application tier, and you also have a, a database tier. And <clears throat> internally, you have uh, load balancers or internal load balancers. That's what ILB stands for. That balances the load or detects whether um, the uh, let's say, for example, if you connect from the outside, it's the load balancer that checks. Bit with that, 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 that does two things. It checks whether web one or web two is the one that's available. So you can also do round robin or any type of load balancing algorithm to ensure that you balance the load between different web servers, different application servers, or different SQL servers. A typical app deployment on Azure then looks like this. You can use a service called Azure Load Balancer um, that, that you can, so you can balance uh, network traffic from external or internal to different virtual machines. You can also apply network security group automation scripts, and you can also apply managed disk and, and replicated item properties so to replicate data between two different managed disks. And then you can also apply availability sets um, in replicated item properties. So this, as a result, you have an application aware disaster recovery setup. So if you take a look at this application, uh, this uh, diagram carefully, you have two, uh, let's say you have, uh, you're using two different Azure regions, one Southeast Asia and one Asia, one East Asia, Hong Kong. You have exactly the same setup. You have, uh, you have two web servers, two application servers, uh, but the difference is that on the first setup on the left side, you have two SQL servers that form an availability set. For some reason, you don't have a dual availability set on the other side, but you have the, this third availability set um, 
tied up with the first two SQL servers on the first site, and then you are using, uh, let's assume that this is Microsoft SQL Server, so therefore you are using SQL, SQL Server always on to ensure that you have three databases or three physical SQL installations that are replicating each other. Then at the highest level, you would have something like a uh, service call, service, let's say you're using some form of uh, network traffic manager, such as Azure Traffic Manager, that uh, balances that balances traffic in between sites via public IP and using DNS, uh, working together with your DNS to ensure that traffic is uh, balanced between the two different sites. And also, uh, disaster resiliency is also built in because uh, the traffic manager can also detect whether one site is unavailable and therefore not use that site anymore. So what are your options for failover? Um, and you've seen some examples over here. So you've seen in this diagram, like you can use ASR replication or Azure Site Recovery replication um, from an active VM to, an, to another active VM in the second region, or you can just simply use ASR to back up your VMs as a backup medium on the other region. You can use SQL Server on, SQL Server always on to replicate SQL, Microsoft SQL Server instances across uh, instances across multiple regions and you can use of course AD replication if you're using uh, Active Directory in this case. So you will notice here that when traffic goes through, um, let's say a user comes in and then they, it hits the public DNS first, the public DNS will then resolve um, let's say he enters your URL like mycompany.com. Azure Traffic Manager, as you can see here, which is a service in Azure, is the one that tells the public DNS that the available IP address that should be, that the, the IP address that should be resolved against the URL, the, the FQDN that was entered by the user is that. So therefore, the user will then hit this particular um, um, region first because it's Traffic Managers was the one that says that what's the one that said that you go to this IP address first and then the internal load balancer then kicks in and let's assume that the internal infrastructure of that is you have two webs here you have two web servers where you have load balancers balancing the traffic in between now what if for example for some reason your the public IP at the the first region becomes unavailable what happens is that traffic manager will then know that the second that the first IP address becomes unavailable and therefore when the public when a user kick, uh, looks, makes a look up for your FQDN or your website like www.mycompany.com, the DNS entry will be the second IP address that pertains to this second site rather than the first site. It was Azure Traffic Manager that actually told the, the, the public DNS provider to use the second IP address because the first IP address be not, is not available. Now, Traffic Manager is a service in Azure that sort of acts like a... Um, yeah, <laughs> it does what it said. It does. It does what it's named for. It's traffic manager. It's the one that checks whether certain IP addresses or certain protocols are available or not. It works across uh, la different layers. In um, it can be HTTPS, it can be IP, it can be TCP. So whatever protocol that you use to connect to the application, the traffic manager can actually determine uh, whether that um, connection method is available on one IP address between two different sites. You can also use, like I said before, you can also use Azure Site Recovery to, replic uh, to replicate your on-site infrastructure to Azure. So essentially, you're using Azure as your replication site. You uh, And your VMs can run on, uh, your source VMs can be on Hyper-V, on Windows Server, Linux Server. It can be even physical or, or VMware. Um, so it has, uh, so, so essentially, again, you're using um, Azure as your secondary site or as a backup of all of the VMs that you're currently running on prem. Now, so far we have talked about Azure Site Recovery and Azure Backup. Those are what we call first party services on Azure, meaning those are Azure services that you can easily configure and turn on uh, in the Azure portal. But the fact is you may already be comfortable with uh, your current provider of replication, disaster recovery, or backup. And this is the reason why we are partnered with a lot of these organizations. So you have a choice. You can actually use Azure Backup Insight Recovery as with Azure, Microsoft Azure, or you can choose to continue to use uh, an, 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 a number of third-party ISV solutions that we're currently So here's an example. Um, think of it as a decision tree. So if your source 
uh, if if your if if the VMs that are in your source are actually physical servers, you can choose to use um, Azure Site Recovery if you want, or you can use services from Cloud Endure and Veritas. Now, of course, Cloud Endure and Veritas are not uh, Microsoft products. These are solutions from the respect the respective uh, partners. Um, so you have a choice between three in this case. Um, if your if the source is virtual servers, if it's Hyper V, you can use Zerto or Site Recovery. If it's VMware, you can choose Veritas, Zerto, Cloud Endure, Azure Site Recovery. Or if you're using KVN or Zen, uh, you can use Cloud Endure because currently Azure Site Recovery does not support KVM or Zen. But the point here is that Cloud Endure and all of the partners that you see here are actually services that are available on the Azure Marketplace. So if you are a current Azure customer, you can immediately avail of these services by installing them or subscribing from uh, subscribing these from the Azure Marketplace directly. And you can even see here that if your um, source is an enterprise NAS, we, are, we have a partnership with NetApp that allows you to replicate data from your enterprise NetApp apps Net, uh, NetApp uh, data from your enterprise NAS or to, to, to Azure using the NetApp uh, solution. For backup, it really depends on what you want to do. So if let's say, for example, you want to use uh, Azure as an enterprise tape replacement. And if let's say you're currently uh, happy with your current provider, you can choose from all of these providers here that you see here on this box and that all of them actually have solutions that run on Azure and can support Azure dif uh, the different Azure types of storage. If you're not happy with your current partner, if you want to choose to use Microsoft uh, Microsoft server, then you can definitely do that. If you want to use um, Azure to store backups of your, of your client PCs or your Windows PCs, Azure Backup has an agent that you can install on Windows PCs that can replic that can back up the contents of your Windows PCs to, to Azure, or you can use a third-party so third-party supported software such as the ones from Carbonite. And these are our different. Uh, this is just a sample of the top uh, partners that we have for Azure Backup, all the way from Commvault, Veritas, HPA Enterprise, Dell EMC, Veeam. Um, I won't. I would not be surprised if some of you are already working with these partners. And if you are, um, I would recommend that you continue to talk to these partners, assuming that you're happy with, let's say, for example, Veritas, and ask them if you if they have a solution that allows that allows you to replicate your or to do backup on Azure instead of doing it on uh, on-premise storage. So I'll leave this slide over here. If you're listening to this to re the recording, you can actually pause the recording at this point to see the different workloads that they can backup. Now let's talk about the resiliency capabilities uh, of Azure. Within a data center, you can actually have a what is called an availability set. High availability set essentially means it's protections from hardware failures in a data center. So if you think about it, if you can imagine your VMs or your resources actually runs on a physical server inside one of our data center, an availability set essentially is a pair of virtual machines, if you will, where one virtual machine runs on one server and the other virtual machine runs on another server in the same data center. So it avoids, for example, a rack failure uh, like I said, you never know. Uh, maybe one of the racks in our data center would fail because of hardware failure, storage, or whatever, or, or power, or whatever. At least you have a secondary copy of your VM uh, as an availability set in another server within the same data center. Availability zone, on the other hand, is a high availability protection against loss of data centers. In each Azure region, there are multiple data centers. So this, so this is the reason why we don't call it 58 data centers. We call it 58 regions because in each region, there are more than one data centers, which are physically separated zones. Each zone includes independent network cooling or power. So think about it as if let's say you have a virtual machine that's running on one data center rack in data center one or zone one, you have your second VM machine, which is a replica of your first VM on another server rack that runs on another data center on zone two in the same region. You can also have what is called regional pairs. 
This essentially gives you protection of your data and applications from the loss of an entire region. So for example, and so far this hasn't happened yet, let's say the entire Hong Kong data center region of Microsoft becomes unavailable, then your resources are available across a different region. So this is what I was saying a while ago. So you can translate it in terms of how you want your virtual machines in Azure to be resilient. You can configure it as a single VM. So if you have a single VM, you can use premium storage and this will give you 99.9%. .9%. If you want to increase your virtual machine SLA from 99.9% .9 to 99.95%, .95%, then configure your VM as an availability set. With that means it means it runs on two separate server racks within the same data center. If you want to further increase your SLA to 99.99%, then configure your VMs with availability zones. And if you want to have more than four nines, configure your data your virtual machines using ASR, for example, or Azure Site Recovery, to 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 uh, to, re to to replicate across different regions across the 58 regions within Microsoft or even within your own data center. I know some customers who run their production data centers on, on Azure, but the backup is actually their own physical data center. So it's kind of the reverse. So remember, we always tell our customers that, again, if it, especially if it's IaaS, a lot of the responsibility for reliability and resiliency uh, actually is, is dependent on you. So you have to make sure that you configure your VMs with the right level of, uh, of, uh, of availability based on the required SLA that you have. And if you tie it up against what I said in the beginning, the amount of SLA, the, 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 the SLA requirement shouldn't be always 99.999%. It depends on how critical your application is going to be. Because if you're going to make all of your VMs across regional pairs, it can be very expensive. Uh, because you're, again, you're using a number more number of resources. So you'd have to make a little bit of uh, priorities in terms of your applications. So guarding your net, so making sure that your application is also resilient against network failures also depends on how you use uh, load balancers. Do you use load balancers externally or those internally? You can definitely use the load balancers that are part of the Azure service, or you can use a number of ISV load balancers or partner load balancers that are available in the marketplace. Um, what you really want to do is you want to make it, you want to make high availability and robust performance of your applications using the proper implementation of load balancers. So it's an architecture question, um, part of, being, of making sure that you have a resilient architecture for your application. Um, right now, we actually have the ability for you to do zone redundant VPNs or virtual gateways. So the virtual gateway solution of Microsoft has been around for quite some time already. So you can actually uh, right now um, split ingress and egress traffic. So for example, you have a different set of application logic that runs on a different set of VMs that specifically takes care or should respond to ingress traffic. And you have a different set of functions from a different set of VMs that should respond to, that should uh, send out traffic to the users uh, via egress traffic. And you now have the ability, ability in virtual gateways to split. Now let's talk about storage. Um, there are three different types of storage. So whenever you choose the type of storage medium on Azure for a large part, you are given a choice whether you want LRS, ZRS, or GRS. LRS stands for Locally Redundant Storage. This is the simplest low-cost replication strategy that Azure Storage offers. That's 11 nines. If you want your storage to be replicated across multiple zones, then you choose ZRS, which gives you 12 nines. And then geo-redundant storage, as the name implies, it means that your storage or the data within the storage medium of which you chose GRS option for is replicated across multiple uh, geographies. And of course, uh, the cost per gigabyte of storage will be different depending on the type of uh, storage resiliency you choose, whether it's LRS, ZRS, or GRS. Uh, so the cost of all of these options are not, are not exactly the same. Now, when we talk about um, 
applications that are not VM. So, so far, the examples that we've seen are, are, are applications running as standalone code with their own application engine, if you will, that runs on VMs. Now, we've, we're starting to see, or we are starting to see a number of customers that are choosing to use platform as a service or Azure PaaS services rather than using IaaS. So here's an example of, um, of an application that runs not on a VM, but it runs on web app or the app services on Azure uh, that triggers certain functions uh, that, that is being managed by, the, by Azure functions, which can either trigger a SQL database call or a SQL database uh, write or trigger an Azure search. So what you see here in this architecture is that, first of all, you have to make sure that the SQL servers are replication, replicating across the two different regions. So in this case, you have two different you have two regions. You have an active region, which may be Singapore. You may have a standby region, which may be, for example, Hong Kong. So your users that are authenticated on Azure Active Directory uh, uses, for example, Azure DNS. You can There's actually a service in Azure called Azure DNS that can serve as your public DNS provider. And you have a service here called Azure Front Door that does two things. It kind of works the same way as Traffic Manager, except that Front Door is more HTTP and HTTPS centric rather than Traffic Manager, which can do multiple protocols. So Front Door is the one that load balances uh, where your traffic will go, on which instance of the application will it, it will go and it also detects whether one region or let's say this 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 um uh, this this instance of the application is unavailable it can automatically switch the users to this up uh, to this uh, instance of the application in the standby region it uh, it well, if you want to skip app services, front door can also do direct uh, traffic into Azure functions, if you will. Uh, yeah, we can do that. And for VPN gateways, you can configure VPN gateways to become active passive. So let's say you have an on-premises data center and you have an on-prem VPN appliance that peers with the Azure VPN gateway on Azure, and that is active. You can actually have configure your VPN uh, your, v, your VPN appliance to, to pair with two different VPN gateways because our VPN gateway capability has the ability to do load balancing as well. You can do the reverse and you can also do dual redundancy. So in case uh, one of your VPN appliances fails on-prem, you can switch to the other VPN and you can talk to both VPN appliances that you have as counterparts on Azure. And finally, you can also use VPN Gateway as your high availability the VNet to VNet, especially if you are connecting two different Azure regions uh, or, your sub, or your application is running, running across two different Azure regions and you're using Azure VPN Gateway to connect both of them. So let's try to summarize uh, what, the, what are the stuff that we've learned so far. So remember, if you have a single virtual machine, one of the probable failures that you can get is a hard disk issue with the machine itself. <clears throat> in a data center, what are the possible failures in a data center? So for example, it can be a hardware failure, a server rack issue or the power supply that supplies power for, entire, for the entire server rack can actually fail. Within a, re, within a data center, <clears throat> You can have an you you can have a entire data center go offline. So, for example, um, there was an incident actually in the past where a lightning strike happened, which conked out one of the um, central U.S. data centers of Azure. It wasn't our fault, of course. It's an act of nature, an act of God, if you will, where the lightning strike was so intense that the data center power. Uh, was actually was was uh, was actually terminated within that data center. It took maybe about two or three hours for our engineers to bring that data center back up. Within a region, and so far, again, like I said, it doesn't it hasn't happened yet. An entire region becomes unavailable. So think about all data centers in Hong Kong becoming unavailable, or all data centers within the West US region becoming unavailable. So think about the different types of um, disasters that can happen from a single hardware failure all the way to an entire region failure. And you have to plan your resiliency around that. Now, what about data? It can be accidental data loss, data corruption, ransomware, or even a rogue administrator. So how do you solve against that? 
For single VMs, use premium storage to bring up your SLA to 99.9%. For to guard against hardware failures in a single data center, use availability sets to bring up your SLA to 99.95%. To guard against entire data center failures within the same region, use availability zones. And to guard against multiple region failures, or it's not just, okay, I should take, take it back. It's not just about failures, but also accessibility. Uh, you know, there's always been stories about certain regions not being available, be, not because the data center failed or the region failed, but because of a, of a major networking issue that is beyond Microsoft's control. Say, for example, a cable break within the submarine cables. So to do that, um, use Azure Site Recovery or any of our third-party ISV partners to replicate your data or your VMs from one region to the other. Now, how do you guard against all of these all of these uh, issues on possible issues on data? You have to have backup. So backup from uh, your on-premise storage to Azure, backup from one storage in one region to another uh, region in Azure, and as an example, and go back to to go back to restore to a healthy version of the data. As you can see here. Um, uh, Premium uh, single VM with premium storage improves your availability. Using availability sets and availability zones allows you to build and run highly reliable applications with near zero RPO and RTO. And it also and using Azure Site Recovery across different regions also allows you to implement disaster recovery plans <clears throat> with data resilient residency and minimal RPO and RTO real um, real time to recovery. Now. Um, this is a short one hour webinar, so I wouldn't be able to review all of the different permutations of how you can make your architecture resilient. So we have created a site called aka.ms slash architecture review for you to access different architectural frameworks. Uh, these are tools for customers and our partners and also for ourselves to optimize workloads across costs, DevOps, scalability, resiliency, and security. So do visit this site so you, you can get a um, um, better idea and see a number of a large number of examples of how to make your uh, infrastructure resilient. And these are the different sites that, uh, that you can use. So I just chose some of the ones that may be useful for you. Like for example, how do you use backupping? How do you use, back, how do you use backup to archive your application from on-premise or from the cloud? So I'll so pause the recording at this point so you can uh, copy the URLs and visit the URLs if you will. So that's the end of our webinar today. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, just want to make sure that uh, you get access to these resources so you still can get your azure free account you can go to azure.com slash free enter your credit card information don't worry we're not going to charge your credit card what you will get is a 200 dollars credit and 12 months usage of a lot of free services as long as as long as you don't go over the limits of these different services such as 750 hours of linux virtual machine or Linux VM or 250 gigabytes of SQL database, your $200 remains intact. The only time your $200 gets debited or gets subtracted from is when you start going over the service limits over here. You also get access to a lot more services on Azure and uh, these are all free. It doesn't get charged against your $200. So literally when you use your Azure free account, um, you can build a lot of you can you can actually start building a lot of stuff without paying a single cent but if you start if you do start going over certain limits then your you will get a friendly email uh, from from microsoft or an or or, or, a, or a or a message in the azure portal saying that your 200 dollars is now in almost close to zero so therefore you got to either do something about it or uh, start charging your credit card with actual usage Online learning is available. You can do, you can go to the, uh, to uh, Microsoft Learn. So this is the full URL here. But if you don't remember that, you can just search for Microsoft Learn. Select your role. Uh, what type of role are you performing right now? Are you an administrator, AI engineer, data engineer, or data scientist? Once you make a selection, there will be online courses that will be made available to you in accordance to the role that you have just selected. Uh, and these are curated training, which includes video training, hands-on training, code training, um, and so on and so forth. So which will help you prepare 
for your job and it will even help you prepare to pass certification exams. There's a specific school for AI called aischool.microsoft.com. So this is where you can learn how to build chatbots using our conversational AI framework and build applications that can, that can interact with the world around you using cognitive services, applications that can, for example, do uh, voice recognition, image recognition, picture recognition, video recognition, and so on. So all of that is in aischool.microsoft.com. And complete documentation is on docs.microsoft.com. Uh, just click on the Azure link right here and then do a search. Um, it, all of the documentation that you would require, including code samples, uh, to, uh, tips on architecture, architecture diagrams, or just to get you started on using Azure services are all there in Microsoft Docs. Okay, so there we go. We are towards the end of our webinar. I just wanted to remind everyone about the next set of webinars that are coming next. Uh, you see the dates there in front of you. And if you go to aka.ms slash msfy20 webinars, you can you can see this, the next webinars that are coming. And you can also register from that website as well. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me. I have been Hearn. This has been Hearns, your Azure Business Lead from Microsoft Philippines. Uh, thank you very much for listening in. For those of you who entered your question, thank you very much for your questions. Hope to see you soon in our future webinars and our future events. Bye.